This episode of the podcast is brought to you by New Bloom Labs. Hey guys, let's talk for a second about your lab testing. It's one of the biggest, most frustrating bottlenecks in our industry. It's simply unacceptable to wait one to two weeks or even longer for a full panel analysis of your cannabis products. That's why you need to know about New Bloom Labs. Family owned and operated, the guys at New Bloom Labs are the real deal. With locations in Tennessee and Texas and more to come soon, New Bloom Labs provides precise, accurate analysis and the best turnaround time in the industry. New Bloom always provides next business day turnaround on potency tests and one to two day turnaround on most toxin screenings. They're ISO certified and DEA registered so you know their science is first rate. Most cannabis producers are frustrated with their third party labs, but you don't have to be. Call New Bloom Labs today at 844-TEST-CBD or visit their website at newbloomlabs.com. Superior science, rapid results, New Bloom Labs. Hello everyone, Kevin Carrillo here and welcome to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connects podcast. My guest today is Shelby Hartman, co-founder and editor-in-chief at Double Blind. Hello, Shelby. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Um, I was thinking before we started recording, it is a great time to be running a psychedelic digital media company. It is. It's a really exciting time for the psychedelic movement, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I want to I learn more about how you all got, you got started and whatnot, but... Um, just to kind of set the stage for the audience listening. So I have Shelby Hartman on. She's the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Double Blind, uh, which is a biannual print magazine and digital media company at the forefront of the rapidly growing psychedelic movement. So uh, Shelby, you know, we just saw that psychedelics had a huge win um, in, the, in the election with Oregon. Uh, becoming the first state to decriminalize the possession of all drugs, but then also legalizing psilocybin uh, for for therapy, right? So, um, that's right. So, talk a little bit about like you know a little bit about your background and what got you interested in the uh, the whole psychedelic movement. Yeah, so I I spent my entire career as a journalist. Um, I before I even graduated college, I was helping produce at CBS Radio News in Washington, D.C. And, you know, I've done all different kinds of things, worked at the Legacy newspaper in New Orleans and worked as a cannabis columnist at LA Weekly here in Los Angeles. But alongside my professional um, path, I have had, a, as we all have, a, a, a personal path. And that path for me has involved um, psychedelics, and endless inquiry and reading philosophy and meditating and so many other things. And at a certain point, um, my personal and professional paths merged. I was very lucky in that regard. Um, I was a freelancer and I pitched a story for Vice on MAPS's research investigating MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And as is often the case with journalists, one story became another story, became another story. And then all of a sudden one day I woke up and I was like, I'm a psychedelic journalist. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, you Google, if you started to Google psychedelic news and your name starts to pop up a lot, you're like, okay, maybe this is my niche. I've carved it out, right? <laughs> right. That's so funny. So um, tell me this. So I, I have, you know, a little bit of experience when it comes to journalism. So I did an internship at NBC Washington um, when I was in college and I got, you know, firsthand take it at how fast paced the environment is and how cutthroat it can be and whatnot. And so as you kind of transitioned into finding your niche, as you mentioned with psychedelics, was it, and you said it was a kind of a personal and professional path that crossed. So it had to have been really enlightening and, and, and brought a sense of joy and happiness to your life. Right. Yeah, I would say so. I, you know, I was talking with a dear friend um, and journalist Michelle Luke last night about this, and I was asking her, would she ever want to work at like an LA Times or something covering City Hall or Associated Press or Reuters? And, you know, um, maybe I'm being a little too candid here, but I'll just say that when I was working in some of these more mainstream newsrooms, I didn't always feel like I could 
fully be who I am. Right. Um, I remember coming back from my first Burning Man when I was um, assistant producing at um, KNX 1070 News Radio, which is the sort of uh, CBS radio news affiliate here in Los Angeles. And I have nothing but positive things to say about the people in that newsroom and the work that they're doing. But I remember coming back and I was sort of in my like post Burning Man glow and I had my psychedelic, you know, like my fractal bell bottoms on because I was like, you know, walking into the newsroom and I just felt like this isn't my life. Like this isn't where I want to spend every single day, you know, and I feel so blessed that, you know, at Double Blind, we're doing the kind of hard hitting investigative reporting that I am so passionate about, but also we have a very psychedelic culture at the company and I'm dear friends with everyone who I work with. And, you know, we take breaks in the middle of the day to meditate or to do, you know, um, sound bowl ceremonies because I have a Himalayan song bowls here in my house and we jump on trampolines and we light incense like it's just these are my people this is my world and I feel so lucky that like it gets to be my professional world too you know and you know what it's so funny you say that like um, your experience working in in big media and then coming back from Burning Man and you know having that glow still and then kind of just having that that realization like you know, this isn't me. I, I, I want to be in another place. And, and in some ways, the corporate environment can do that, right? Like, I mean, I have experience working in, in, uh, in, in big corporate companies, and there is a, a certain way you need to act in a certain way for some companies you need to dress and look and behave, right? And I think what is unique about the psychedelic industry and also the cannabis industry is that they're, they're both so new that we can kind of rewrite the culture in these industries, you know, and just like you said, implement practices where you're really um, doing what you want to do with your coworkers and making it a more fun and open environment than just being stifled, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. I, you know, we spend so much of our lives at, um, at our jobs. And especially in, in the United States, there's a lot of emphasis placed on your value according to what you quote unquote do, right? And, um, I understand that not everyone is in a position to be able to, you know, work a job where they feel like fully embodied and fully expressed. And like, that's a, a consequence of our economy and the system that we live in. And, you know, my, like my heart and my love, like goes to everyone who is working a job that they don't feel um, they can be themselves at. Right. Um, but I'll just say that like at double blind, it was always really, really important to me to create an environment where pe people feel seen and people feel heard. And we really, really want everyone not just to be excited about the work they're doing at double blind, but to feel that it fits into the greater picture of where they're trying to go in their lives. Sure. No. And I, I agree. I mean, you do feel for the people that are kind of stuck in a dead end job that they're, they don't like, but if you also look, you know, we live in a time now where possibilities are endless right and with the, the the pandemic while of course there was a lot of bad things that happened there was there was good that came out of it and and one is kind of you kind of you know there's different opportunities that have arisen right one of which is the psychedelic industry cannabis is booming um, and so there's there's lots of opportunities for people to kind of maybe pivot and look to those industries as, as alternatives which is is good it's a blessing um, so let's talk about this then. So I want to ask you, um, I know that psychedelics are basically where cannabis was a decade ago, right? Um, so let's talk about first the research that's been done around psychedelics in terms of like post-traumatic stress disorders, as you mentioned, um, how it can help certain communities like the veterans and others and, and what research has been done in this area. Yeah, so there's a lot of research that's being done in the realm of psychedelics, actually a lot more than has been done with whole plant cannabis. Um, for those of you who know about the, the, night, um, the cannabis monopoly at University of Mississippi and how that's affected cannabis research. But anyway, um, the two main substances that have shown the most promise um, for particular indications are MDMA, as you mentioned, for post-traumatic stress disorder, sometimes referred to as ecstasy. Um, and um, it's shown a lot of promise for post-traumatic stress disorder, yes, in the veteran community as a novel treatment for people with treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. As we know, um, the VA is, is really in need of, of some, some new treatment modalities for our veterans, and also women who have suffered from sexual assault, 
uh, people, um, people of color who have suffered uh, race-based trauma, which is something that we wrote about in our inaugural issue. Um, MAPS, it, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is one of the largest psychedelic research nonprofits, is now in the final phase of research to get MDMA through the FDA approval process. Phase three, they've been granted something called breakthrough therapy stat or breakthrough status because their um, their and their treatment has shown so much promise for, um, for for healing people that really have not been able to find um, healing using medications and treatments that are currently available. Yeah. Um, secondarily, um, psilocybin has shown a lot of promise um, for major depressive disorder and treatment resistant depression. Um, as you probably know, there's more than 100 million people around the world with treatment resistant depression, and there hasn't really been a significant class of drugs that have come out for mental health since the 80s when SSRIs hit the market. Um, SSRIs are not very effective and come with a lot of side effects. So, um, so this is very exciting. Psilocybin will also likely be on the market in the next five to 10 years for depression um, in coordination with uh, assisted psychotherapy. So you're not going to be able to just like take psilocybin or MDMA at home, but you're going to be taking these drugs in a clinical setting with therapists who are trained to sit there and support you through your entire experience. Sure. And it's so good. It's so great to hear that, that, that we're looking to uh, other alternative um, medicines and therapies to deal with these, these issues, right? Like depression, like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and whatnot. And so it's, it surprises me how fast the psychedelic industry is moving in terms of uh, being um, given federal, you know, clearance and, and consumer oversight and whatnot. So how, how does the psychedelic industry in terms of federal regulation um, compare to cannabis? Because obviously cannabis is listed as a schedule one. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, inhibitors that, that don't allow us to research the plant. So how is it that the psychedelics and specifically like psilocybin are able to do this? Yeah, well, as mentioned, um, with the cannabis research, it's really just um, the main block to doing whole plant cannabis research has been this monopoly that the University of Mississippi has on whole plant cannabis. So obviously, there's no shortage of cannabis in the United States. <laughs> but um, in order to do research on cannabis, you need to use scientists need to have access to cannabis from this one very particular place. Um, that has been um, granted approval by NIDA. Um, and so it's just, it's really like a, a lack of supply issue is my understanding. And there's been lawsuits filed against the Department of Justice um, and all kinds of steps being taken by scientists and attorneys who are trying to essentially um, uh, get the Department of Justice to approve other universities and places to grow cannabis so that there's just more supply for scientists to do the research that they want to. Um, so that's the issue with the cannabis. Um, with psychedelics, um, you know, it's been a, a long process um, of, of, you know, getting the necessary approvals to investigate these medicines. I mean, Rick Doblin founded the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies in 1986. You know, so he's been working on getting MDMA through the FDA approval process for you know two decades at this point. Um, am I doing my math right? Three decades. Three, de yeah, three decades. <laughs> three decades. Um, and then, of course, there's also um, the issue of the, the simple issue of capital. You know, doing FDA-approved research is very, very expensive. Um, MAPS currently um, just raised $30 million for their phase three trials. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, you got to raise a lot of money and you got to recruit subjects and you have to submit to certain um, standards of rigor right. according to the FDA. It just takes a long time. Right. And well, and that you brought up the point of you had to find um, subjects also. So from my understanding, um, in cannabis, you're not you, you're unable to to test on subjects. Right. So it's like either lab rats or you're just kind of learning about the cannabinoids in a lab. But are you able to test on human subjects with psychedelics? There's no restrictions there. 
you are able to test on humans with whole plant cannabis. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is only one trial right now that is currently um, looking at the efficacy of whole plant cannabis in humans. It's a trial that's being conducted by Sue Sisley, um, and it's looking at cannabis for post-traumatic stress disorder out of Arizona. Um, but yeah, absolutely, psychedelics also are being investigated in humans. I mean, that's necessary to get it through the FDA approval process. Um, I will say that, um, so the way that that works is that, uh, typically, is that um, there has, there's preclinical research, right, which is before humans looking at the promise of various compounds for various indications. Then there's usually a, a phase where the drug is studied in like healthy normals just for safety, to make sure that the drug is safe. And then from there, they start administering the drug to people who have particular conditions that they think that the drug ha might show promise for. Um, and so that's, there's three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, um, and phase three is what happens right before FDA approval. And both the psilocybin and MDMA research are in phase three right now. Got you. See, this is why we have experts on the show like you. See, you, you are very knowledgeable on the subject, and uh, I continue to learn every day. So, yes, thank you so much for that. Um, let's, Shelby, let's talk about the corporatization of psychedelics. So, obviously, um, there's a lot of players that are entering this space now. So, um, talk a little bit about, like, your perspective, you know, co-founding and being the editor-in-chief of, of uh, Double Blind and what, what y'all are working on in that area. Yeah, there's been an exponential interest in psychedelics from major investors um, and entrepreneurs coming out of Silicon Valley for sure in the last couple of years. I would say psychedelics are now probably one of the hottest investment opportunities alongside cannabis and cryptocurrency and AI. Um, it, it gives me the, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Heebies. The heebie-jeebies, that was what I was thinking a little bit. Um, I think that there's definitely a lot of concern among longtime psychedelic advocates, researchers who have been working to overturn psychedelic prohibition for decades because they truly believe in the healing potential of these compounds. Um, there's concern uh, that you know new players, quote unquote, are coming in who don't necessarily have psychedelics, um, psychedelic healing um, as a priority. And they really are kind of seeing the psychedelic industry as quote unquote, the new green rush or someone recently told, told me that they're now calling, people are now calling it the shroom zoom, which is scary. Yeah. Um, I don't like and, it <laughs> Yeah, no, neither do I. And so, um, you know, I wrote a story about this um, in the fourth issue of Double Blind, which uh, came out this month called What Comes After the Plants. And it's looking at all of the psychedelic drug development companies that are now getting into the space in the hopes of getting novel psychedelic compounds and delivery systems through the FDA approval process. Most of those um, research companies are um, not researching in humans right now. They're in what we just discussed before. It's called preclinical research, um, looking at like animal studies and things like that. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah. And, and you're, so you're saying that some, some people outside of the psychedelic industry are coming in and maybe their motives are not as, as well intended as we think. Right. And it's, it could be possibly a money grab like we saw in the cannabis industry uh, as it played out right since the early 2010s. Right. Absolutely. And so um, there's a lot of conversations happening right now within the psychedelic space about how we can ensure that the most number of people possible have access to these access to these compounds for healing. Um, essentially, at the end of the day, it's just about access, right? Like there's a lot of people suffering in the United States and worldwide, even more so now with COVID, we're seeing rates of depression, trauma, anxiety, et cetera, soar. And we just don't wanna find ourselves in a situation where only some people have access to these compounds um, and other people don't. And so, it, you know, it, the conversation does get complicated really quickly because it's, you know, it's great to have these ideals around access and equity, but when we actually start thinking about how we're going to implement models that allow for enough capital to get psychedelics through the research process, but also to keep prices low enough when they get to market that they're going to be accessible for large numbers of people, it, I mean, it really, 
we're live, you know, the, the way that the pharmaceutical process has been sort of designed from the outset doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have access at its core. So the psychedelic industry is in a really interesting position to not only pioneer business models that will allow for access to psychedelics, but to pioneer business models that could potentially be replicated by other pharmaceutical companies and even just companies outside of drug development. Right. See, that's the the latter sounds better, right? To kind of be the pioneer in the space and to uh, set the, the the best practices and the best operating procedures in place then, so that people can mimic it. Right. Yeah. Well, ho hey, here's to you know, fingers crossed, into hoping that 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 plays out, you know. Um, but when you talk about psychedelics from a pharmaceutical perspective, this is where I get really, really fascinated by it. And I know that if we have um, listeners on that are, are new to psychedelics, let's talk a little bit about like just the basic science behind, uh, you know, say psilocybin or even, you know, I've had a guest on that talked about Ibogaine and, and going to the uh, Ibogaine clinics in Mexico and how it helps treat like even addiction for opioid. Uh, so you know, talk a little bit about the science behind the medicinal benefits of psychedelics. Um, so there's different categories of psychedelics, quote unquote, like the classic psychedelics, LSD and psilocybin have shown promise for a lot of the same conditions over the years through research. Um, and really the only reason why we're seeing um, more research into psilocybin instead of LSD is because psilocybin lasts less time. And so it requires less resources on the part of researchers, therapists, et cetera, because, you know, it's obviously you're paying for the therapist's time, you're paying for the researcher's time, and, you know, it's going to cost twice as much if you need someone to sit with you for twice as long. Um, MDMA and ketamine and some of these other drugs, which are often grouped in with psychedelics, aren't really classic hallucinogens, but they're often talked about as psychedelics because they do sort of like prompt shifts in perspective and that are healing if that makes sense yeah um, so mdma is like an impact is often called an empathogen for example and um with our classic psychedelics firstly the thing to understand is that like the um we have limited still have a limited understanding of how they actually work in the brain so even though we have all this data showing like you know someone goes has depression of course according to clinical measures, they take psilocybin, they come out, they don't have depression anymore. We don't fully understand like how that works or why. Um, I mean, I think that the sort of common- um, It's sorry to pause you, but if you had a pie chart and you were to say how much we know about that, like how much of the pie for like a zero to a hundred percent? You know, truthfully, that's not a question for me. That's a question for like Robin Carhart Harris at Imperial College London or Bill Richards, someone who, I mean, you know, I'm a, jur I'm a journalist and I understand the basics of how these things work, but I'm not a neuroscientist. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but I would say that the, the sort of common um, understanding is that um, one of the ways that psych classic psychedelics are effective is that they quiet something called the default mode network, which is an area of the brain in which we sort of perceive time, space, and our sense of self, and that the default mode network gets quieted when we're tripping on psychedelics, um, and sort of a lot of the uh, assumptions that we have made about like who we are and our relationships to other people um, are recontextualized. In what? the case of MDMA, um, as I mentioned, it's an pathogen, and again, like more research needs to be done to verify exactly how it works. But my understanding is that one of the main ways that it works is that it releases oxytocin in the brain, which allows us to, which is often called the love chemical. Oxytocin is also released like when, um, when you hug someone or when you're having sex or like even when a mother breastfeeds. And um, so that um, the release of oxytocin can make you feel more bonded to yourself, more bonded to other people, more bonded to just like the world around you or the universe at large. And it also, um, my understanding is that it also sort of like rewires the way that um, the amygdala functions. The amygdala is the part of the brain that often called the fight or flight response. And what happens when people have trauma is that the amygdala is sort of like, it's out of whack. It's like overactivated or gets triggered in situations where it's not really appropriate for it to be triggered. So that's why, for example, like 
my understanding is that veterans and other people who have post-traumatic stress disorder often have flashbacks, right? Because their amygdala is not functioning properly. And so you might be like, maybe you're, you know, you were a combat veteran and then you're just like in the mall with your family and, you know, like there's like a light flashes or something like that. And it just like sends you back into um, this memory um, that you haven't like fully processed and that you don't have a healthy relationship with. Wow. Yeah. And my mind is just running with so many like questions and thoughts and like fascination of everything you've just said. And, 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 you know, I just go back to your main point of like, we're just scratching the surface of, of how these psychedelics and, and how you categorize them in different, different buckets, how they affect our brain in different ways. It's, it's incredible. I mean, uh, you know, going along with what you, you were talking about with MDMA and how it affects that certain gland in the brain, similar like is, is DMT, right? Where um, our brain naturally produces um, dimethyltryptamine, the, the DMT itself, through the pineal gland. Is that right? And so DMT is just kind of a, a more basically amount of that of that dimethyltryptamine and that feeling is basically the feeling of when you were born or when you're about to die is what I've heard yeah um again this isn't a question for me this is a question this is probably a question for Rick Strassman who is the author of the DMT the spirit molecule and I'm not sure when this is airing but we are having a webinar with him on December 13th that we just announced today called DMT uh, I think it's called Entities and Prophetic States. Um, and he was the one, I think, who initially proposed uh, sort of that DMT is released when you die, if you have a near-death experience, um, and also when you're dreaming, and that it's generated in the pineal gland and all these sorts of things. And I, I honestly couldn't tell you how much research has verified whether that's true or not. I know that there's a lot of people, deep psychonauts, quote-unquote, who are really curious and fascinated by DMT and how it works and why it's generated and what what its function is. Um, but yeah, the only research that I'm really aware of um, looking at DMT looks at the ayahuasca brew, which um, includes DMT. And it has shown that ayahuasca does hold promise for treatment resistant depression, but there is no research actually looking just at the therapeutic potential of DMT itself. Got you. Okay. Well, you're fooling me. I'm sorry. I keep asking you these science-based questions, but you're, you're, you, you sound like a scientist to me. You're very, very smart and knowledgeable in the area. So, <laughs> um, so tell me, you mentioned issue four is coming out. What's included in issue four of double blind? Uh, all kinds of things. <laughs> um, I think that the, the overarching theme for issue four is, um, the expansion of the psychedelic space, all of the new drug development companies that are getting into it, and um, sort of what we talked about before, which is how can the psychedelic space pioneer equitable business models, and then also what's going on with um, certain indigenous communities that have long preserved the knowledge around plant medicines. Um, we have a long, really gorgeous feature in the, in the book um, on the Huichols, which is an indigenous community in Mexico, which has migrated across the desert for um, 15,000 years to collect their sacred peyote. And they've actually found um, ashes from ceremonies in the desert and carbon dated them to 15,000 years ago. And they're struggling to preserve this land amid like extractive forces, amid peyote tourism. Um, And then we also have another feature looking at the Matisse, which is an indigenous community in the Amazon um, that uses uh, um, nene or hape as well as combo um, and their struggles to sort of preserve their ancestral traditions. And I think that to us, like there was, um, it was really important, particularly in this issue, but always to include a lot of stories featuring indigenous voices and their um, and their struggles alongside all of the news about the psychedelic drug development because it's a really interesting and important juxtaposition. And you know, the science we're all about reporting on the science. We're all about you know um, the the therapeutic potential of psychedelics, but we also don't want to neglect to talk about the ceremonial use of psychedelics and um, to uphold reverence for different contexts in which people have these experiences because 
we don't at Double Blind believe that like taking psychedelics in a clinical context with two therapists is necessarily better than doing ayahuasca in a ceremony in the Amazon or um, taking Uboga in Gabon or anything else. Right. Yeah. I mean, you got to pay tribute to the people who, who, where this came from, right. And how it all started. Um, and, and it's important to preserve, um, that legacy for these, those indigenous people. And it's great that double blind is featuring them. So, so is it going to be just in this issue or will you guys continue to kind of feature and highlight these indigenous populations, um, throughout? Yeah, it's a huge part of our mission is to uphold the reverence for indigenous wisdom of plant medicine. So on Double Blind's website, we have a sacred reciprocity fund. When you check out of our store, 100% um, of that money goes to organizations that um, are led by indigenous people and or, um, um, and or supporting indigenous communities. Um, it, yeah, it's just been a really important part of our mission since day one. That's awesome. And after we, we are done recording, if there's any links that you want to share with me that I can put in the description box that people can refer to, um, I'd be happy to do it. So, Great. yeah. Um, so, you know, as this industry is just taking off at, at a, a rapid rate, like when do you foresee, you know, the first, uh, sh you know, psilocybin dispensary uh, in the United States? Um, that's a question that a lot of people are asking. It's also not a question that anyone has an answer to right now. Um, we did a story um, on psilocybin dispensaries in Canada. And I, you know, I actually need to do a little more digging into this because I haven't quite figured out why it is that Canadians seem to be so much ballsier about leaning into the psilocybin black market than Americans are because psilocybin is also still a, a schedule or um, a scheduled substance on the federal level in Canada. But we are seeing a lot of quote mail order dispensaries. Um, these websites, they li there are literally just like websites where anyone can go and just order psilocybin and it, it gets delivered to your doorstep. And I also know that Dana Larson, who was a, a, a cannabis uh, pioneer, in Vancouver is interested in opening a brick and mortar. Um, but in the United States, we really haven't seen anything like that yet. Um, TBD, whether um, all of the decriminalization initiatives that are sweeping the country, decriminalizing psychedelics at the local level does allow for like, quote unquote, like gray market dispensaries or brick and mortars to pop up. But to me, it feels like pretty early to say but that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I spent some time in Amsterdam in 2015 and I went there at the time there was five smart shops. Everybody's familiar with the, the coffee shops, the smoke shops, but they actually had psilocybin smart shops where you walk in, there's a menu, you know, they ask you if you want the, uh, the body high, which is a one, or you can go all the way to the, the five, which is the face melters, <laughs> you know, and uh, it was very normalized there, you know. Um, so have you ever had that kind of experience where you'd walk in and, and done that in, in any other country? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been to Amsterdam and I also bought truffles when I was there. Um, what's going on in the Netherlands is really interesting. The Netherlands has a booming psilocybin retreat center scene where folks can go and actually have supported psilocybin experiences. We've partnered with Synthesis, which is a psilocybin retreat center that um, does ceremonies and is working with Roz Watts, who is one of the leading researchers at a psychedelic researchers at Imperial College London, alongside Robin Carhart Harris. And so they really are in administering psilocybin that it, in a way that's like informed by research and informed by science. Um, as a way to provide people with therapeutic psilocybin experiences prior to being able to access psilocybin like through the FDA or legally through Canada or whatever. Um, so, uh, but in these retreat centers, they're administering um, truffles. They're not administering like psilocybin. Um, the only difference really being from what we know empirically is that truffles are less potent. So you just need more of them, but the law has allowed for sort of this weird loophole where truffles are allowed and psilocybin mushrooms um, are not. Hmm. Um, I, um, yeah, I haven't um, experienced anything like that anywhere else. I know that there are also are um, quite a few psilocybin retreat centers and ceremonies in Mexico and in Jamaica. Okay. So Mexico and Jamaica are the others that 
that have those centers. That's wow. And I have another question just out of curiosity. And I, I heard this from someone and how difficult is it to, to grow fungi? Not hard. <laughs> no, no. We have a lot of information on how to grow mushrooms on double blinds um, website, but um, yeah, it's an interesting thing because psilocybin spores are actually legal in 47 states, all states but California, Idaho, and Georgia. Um, but as soon as you start to grow, they're legal for micro microscope use only, essentially meaning like you can look at the spores under a microscope if you're interested in doing that, but they're not legal to actually grow. <laughs> gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it's not very hard and um, actually... Um, the decriminalization initiatives, both the one that passed in Denver decriminalizing psilocybin in May of 2019, and also the decriminalized nature initiatives, which are decriminalizing all naturally occurring psychedelics, including San Pedro, ayahuasca, peyote, et cetera. Actually, I should be careful about saying peyote because not all of the initiatives include mention of that for a whole other host of reasons we can talk about. But um, but essentially, all of these initiatives do include what's called grow, gather, gift stipulations, and they were written in such a way to encourage people to actually grow their own medicine, um, even though it's not legalized, it's just decriminalized. Um, and a lot of the folks in the decriminalization movement are actually hoping that a um, grow your own movement is going to serve as kind of an alternative to some of these psychedelic drug development companies, which may or may not, as we discussed before, put, put access and equity at the center of their business models. Yeah, I think that that would be a win-win scenario, right? I mean, if, if the, the drug prices are, get too high, you know, due to the, the big pharma, then, you know, at least the patient would have the option to grow themselves, right, for personal use. Yeah, that's sort of the idea, and obviously that was also was the idea with cannabis, um, although we haven't seen that play out so much, um, but we have in some ways. Right. we got to stay positive, Shelby. we got to stay positive. <laughs> so, hey, last question. Um, where, like, we've seen, you know, reform and we've seen decriminalization, like you mentioned, in Denver, Oregon. So what, what states or cities do you foresee psychedelics being decriminalized or even legalized next? Yeah. Um, so Berkeley has a decriminalized nature initiative. Um, Chicago, I mean, there's actually more than a hundred cities and counties now uh, that have um, decriminalization, decriminalized nature movements in some form or another. So it's, it's, it's going really fast, but I think that we'll probably see like Berkeley or Chicago um, go next. That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of my sense, but um, who knows? Right. Yeah. Over a hundred. Wow. That's, that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. The movement is, is uh, picking up like wildfire. That's great. That's great to hear. And again, that's a great position for you to be in as the uh, co-founder of Double Blind. So, um, you know, we've talked about a lot. I really appreciate all the insights that you've given today. Is there anything um, that you want to touch on before we, we wrap up? No, not particularly. Um, I mean, I, I always like to say um, for folks who are listening, um, psychedelics hold incredible potential for healing, and we obviously really believe in them at Double Blind, but also psychedelics aren't a panacea. So it's important to know that psychedelics aren't for everyone. And even if psychedelics are for you, you know, you can't necessarily expect that you're going to trip once and all your problems are going to go away. Um, it really is a lifelong journey that involves preparation, um, navigating the experience, integrating it afterwards. Um, and, you know, we, we have a lot of information on our website. Obviously, we also have a course that we put together with literally the leading psychedelic experts, Rick Doblin, Jess Becker, Bill Richards, Rick Strothman, et cetera, um, for folks who have never tripped before and want some information on how they can begin to safely embark on a journey with psychedelics. So you can check that out on our website. But, um, but yeah, I just like, always like to give that little disclaimer. Um, psychedelics are amazing, but they're not going to solve all your problems. Right. No, that's very well said. I appreciate you saying that. Um, and and re remind me one more time, when is the Dr. Strassman um, interview? Because I want to see if I can get this published before then. Oh, it's December 13th. Um, we're having a webinar with him. Yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get it out well before then. So uh, I'll, I'll add that link to the Eventbrite link in the uh, description box for YouTube. Great. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So awesome. And one last thing, where can people find you your website, your social media? 
Yeah, we're Double Blind Mag on everything. So our website is doubleblindmag.com. You can buy a copy of the magazine there or sign up for our courses or our webinars or just read our online content. And then um, at Double Blind Mag is our handle on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and soon TikTok. <laughs> uh, TikTok dances are coming. The, the Double Blind team is going to start t- TikTok dancing it up. Yeah, I'm going to dance for you. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can't wait to see it. I'll be following for sure. <laughs> Hey, Shelby, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, okay? Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Yes, and thank you all for listening. Bye. Bye.